What's going on, Abel? How you doing? Uh, good to see you, man. Or, well, hear from you, I guess I should say. Uh, where are you guys from? Yeah, let me know where you're from. So, hey, from San Diego. Hello from Chicago. Chicago. What's going on? <clears throat> Some high-quality H2O. Sounding great. Hey, Franny. Hey, I meant to get back to you. I'll, uh, I'll get back to you uh, tonight <laughs> after this. Sorry about that. Hey, everyone. So, um... Um, uh, there's probably gonna be a bunch of you that are watching this after the fact, so uh, don't mind as I'm just kind of chatting with some of the people live here, and you're gonna see that throughout. So if you're only checking this out afterwards, um, you know, just bear with us with that, but you can skip that stuff, which is pretty cool. Slovakia, Lexington, Kentucky. Hello from Albuquerque. In Russia, it's 1.05 p.m. Utah, what's going on from how are you, the UK? Hello, I know it's late there. Uh, Denver, Colorado. I was just in Denver recently, actually, uh, for a wedding. Northwest College, Powell, Wyoming. Hello from Wyoming. Missouri, what's up, Dave? Hello, Tim P. Uh, Norway, from Ukraine. How are you? Hope you're safe. Hope you're doing well. Homeland, California. Trinidad, hello, hello, hello. Man, it's so great to see um, everybody from so many different places. Edmonton, I believe AB is Alberta, Canada. Uh, oh, wow. Everybody's all over. <laughs> you are. It's hey, Charlie. How's it going? How's school going, Charlie? I uh, hope it's going well for you. Um, you're live inside our ambulance. Whoa. Hey, everybody in the ambulance. I <laughs> uh, hope you guys learned something about outlining changes. Um, Essex, UK. Awesome. So I want to get into this. So this isn't going to be a, a three-hour uh, masterclass like some of my other ones are. This is going to be a shorter one uh, because I'm, I'm focusing on a more specific topic today. By the way, if there's any um, audio or video issues, please just let me know in the comments. Um, I believe it's okay uh, and nobody said anything yet. So uh, if it isn't okay or something's too loud, uh, something's too soft or something's not, not working quite right, just please let me know. I'd like to fix it. Don't let me go an hour <laughs> if something's super wrong. From Nigeria... Hello all the way from Princeton, New Jersey. Hello, Princeton, New Jersey, wherever that is in the world. Um, <laughs> so real quick, let's just get a couple things out of the way. I use this um, Rocco's Modern Life mug for the children out there. This is a, uh, a TV show that was on when I was, I guess, your age uh, or younger. And uh, I don't use this mug because I particularly love the mug, although I do love it. But it's, it's really wide at the base, so it's harder to spill because I have spilled many mugs of coffee and tea uh, right on this desk and other places. So that's why, because people have asked in the past. This is a cup of black coffee, like always. So today, um, I wanted to go through a, um, a specific topic on outlining chord changes. I, I put something out a few days ago because I had a couple ideas in mind and I could have done a, a number of different ideas and I wanted to do one that you wanted um, more information on or you wanted to see. And most people chose outlining chord changes. Outlining chord changes is a very specific thing. All right, outlining chord changes. Um, so let's take a step back for a second. I'm gonna be approaching this in a jazz standard kind of way. And when we're looking at, you know, jazz songs and, and looking at a jazz standard, a real book tune, something like that, and how do we get through the song? And, and not only does this work over standards, it works over non-standard tunes as well. In this masterclass, I'm not going to be talking about, and by the way, put your questions in throughout. I will be checking the chat. So if you have a question specifically, ask me, and maybe at the end, I'll open it up for just like random questions. But for now, if it's about voice leading and, and outlining changes and improv stuff, I'll answer them. So I won't be talking specifically about voice leading here. I did a whole free masterclass on that that you can watch on my website. 
Uh, it's, I believe it's the second link in the description down below here on YouTube. It's called The Best Way to Create Melodic Solos. It goes through my six-step process on voice leading. Um, there is a whole, I, it's only, I only use diatonic stuff there. And um, there's a couple other things that I, I do and I will be showing you very soon uh, where I go even more in depth with it, my entire six step process over different songs and things, but you're gonna have to wait a little bit on that. But I won't be talking about voice leading specifically today. So as I'm going through this, the question you probably have, especially if you've improvised a little while, is gonna be like, okay, yeah, I can play these notes, but how do I connect them to make a solo? So that's a separate thing completely. Today is kind of like a step before voice leading. This is, okay, how do I learn a song? Like, what? how do I play through a song? Like, what's the first thing I should do if I'm looking at the chord changes of a song and I want to be able to at least follow the chord changes, play the right notes at the right time, and then I can focus on voice leading, creating melodic solos and stuff. Like, what do I do? I don't like free jazz. I think you should have to pay for jazz. <laughs> nice, J Dustin. Hi, by the way, and uh, great comment. Um, so when you first look at a set of chord changes, you know, yes, you can just write out the chord changes. You can, you know, go through and just kind of, you know, look at their function or something at first. But I, I think there is a, a better methodical way that you can go through this. Um, and it's a way that I've used with all my students. I used it when I started playing. Um, and it's really, really helpful. And just before I get into it, before I get into it, I just want to always say that my whole perspective for teaching, and I'm sure you've seen it recently with a lot more of the educational videos I'm putting out, but I've been a teacher for a long time. My philosophy is always try to make it as simple as possible. Make it clear, make it concise, make it efficient. You know, a lot of teachers teach things in a very convoluted way. They take all these extra steps or they, they make you do things that don't really help you in your practicing. Right, and I'm I can go on rants for hours about uh, bad music teachers, or at least music teachers that make things more complicated for the students, which I think is a bad music teacher. Good music teacher should, um, a good music teacher. Sh Sorry, I was reading the chat there. A good music teacher should be able to convey ideas and get you to be able, you as the student, to be able to learn them and and decipher them and practice them in the quickest, clearest, most concise most efficient way possible. It's not cutting corners, but it's just not adding in all the extra stuff. Now, there are certain times when it's good to know all the extra stuff. Like when I talked about the tritone substitution, I gave my simple way of getting the sound, but I also gave you the justification for how I came about it. So that's different. That's just showing you here are the options. It's almost like talking about modes of a major scale. I could tell you that a Locrian scale is a flat two, a flat three, flat five, flat six, flat seven. That's really complicated. Or I can say, just play a major scale, but start on the seventh. Bam, there's Locrian. You know what I mean? So like, there's those two ways. Simplicity is effective. I'm all about making it simple, 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 simple. Okay? So, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna dive into, if, by the way, if you haven't downloaded the PDF yet, if you're on my email list, you already got this PDF earlier today. Um, and if you're not on that list, please go into the description here. The first link, um, I believe it is called, Download the free PDF worksheet to go along with this video. So please download that PDF and we're gonna go through that together. I'm gonna have it up on my screen, but I also want you to have it so you can follow along. Maybe you can write on it if you print it out, whatever you wanna do. So I'm gonna dive into that PDF now. So here we go. Wonderful. Um, we are now in the PDF. If someone could just let me know if you can see this nice and clearly, I should be in the bottom corner. Uh, just give me give me like a thumbs up or a yes if you can see the PDF and me and still hear me. I just want to make sure it's uh, going well. Dustin is a simpleton, so that's good. Yeah, me too. Just let me know if you guys can hear me, see everything okay, and then we will dive deep uh, into this. And I'll explain kind of some of the things I wrote here. Um, I'm just going to start ahead. So what you notice right out of the gate here with this PDF is that first of all, it's called outlining chord changes, B-flat blues, jazz blues. What is a jazz blues? A jazz blues is, first of all, it's talking about the form of a 12-bar blues. When I say jazz blues, I'm talking about the, the chords that we use today. If you were to just call, hey, let's play a blues. Let's play, you know, Billy's Bounce. Let's play Tenor Madness, whatever. It's gonna be these changes for the most part, maybe some alterations. For example, in bar two, in bar two, you might have, um, uh, on beats three and four, you might put the sharp four there. So in this case, E diminished seven sometimes. Um, you might have some other things here and you might have some other altered chords like in bar eight 
where it says D minor seven to G seven, you might see D minor seven flat five to G seven flat nine, like things like that. But for the most part, this is the outline. A simple blues is what I call the one, four, five blues. Um, a one, four, five blues where you just have the one chord, the four chord and the five chord. So in B flat, it'd be B flat seven, E flat seven and F seven. That's kind of the basis for the blues. I'm talking about the jazz blues because this is what most people are going to be playing. This is what most people are going to be trying to solo over. Um, and also there's like, you know, a bird blues, which has a lot of added two fives. There's some other variations, but I'm just sticking with this. This is kind of uh, normal. Um, and okay, so first thing I want you to do is I want you to look at how I wrote it. So this is, by the way, in, in concert key, concert key treble clef. So the PDFs, when you click that, you're going to get an email that gives you all four concert key treble, concert key bass. Uh, B flat and E flat. If you play French horn or something uh, and you want this, email me separately and I'll give it to you. But for the most part, people are either concert, bass clef, uh, B flat or E flat. So I wrote out all the chord tones just stacked. So this is, if you're, if, if you're looking at a jazz blues for the first time or you want to really learn the changes or you feel like you're playing by ear a lot and you want to dig inside the changes more, this is for you. This is how I go about analyzing any song or not analyzing a song, but outlining a song if I didn't know it. And by the way, this is not something you need to do once you've done a thousand songs. Like I don't need to do this entire process now when I do it because I've done it so many times. Just like right now, if I told you to stand up and walk across the room, you wouldn't really have to think right leg, then left leg, right? You've done it so many times, you get the point. Um, but if you're still at that point where you're playing by ear or you feel like you're, the chords are passing you by too quickly, like they're moving too quick or you're not sure where to land, this is the process, okay? So the first thing I want to do is write out all the chord tones of all the chords in, just stack them. You could write them, you know, any way you want, but just so you have them in time. The key here is that you're putting them in time. What I mean in time is this. In measure one, we have B flat seven. Okay, whoops. In, in measure one, we have B flat seven. So that means it's going to be one full measure. So that's why I wrote four whole notes. Okay, so four whole notes, B flat seven. On measure two, we have E flat seven. So that'd be the four chord. And if you noticed, I did write some Roman numerals above them. I'll get to those in a second because the Roman numeral thing, some people were actually emailing me and asking me about. And I wrote them specifically like this and I'll explain. So when you have a measure with two chords, like in bar four, okay, in bar four, you have F minor seven to B flat seven. So I, that's why I wrote half notes. So you understand first, when are the chords moving? How long are we on each chord for? That in and of itself is tricky. A lot of times when people play over a blues, they, they think by ear too much or they're only solo when using a blues scale or they're thinking all these different things. So what happens is they're not focused on when the actual chords are moving. I always tell people a blues has a lot of changes, especially a jazz blues. Like this has more changes than a lot of standards, right? Like this has more chord changes than the song Solar or even Blue Bossa, I think. So a blues has a, it moves a lot. Um, there's never more than one bar in a row with the same chord. So you notice I wrote all the chord tones out first. So that would be what I call step one. Now here's where you're really gonna start to, you know, learn the chords. What I would do first is just play the chord tones. By the way, if you have your instrument with you or you wanna grab your instrument and play along, please do because there's gonna be a couple times here when I play through an exercise and I'll explain it to you. And um, uh, I think it'd be fun if you wanna play along. If not, you can play it when it's on the playback here or just do this exercise on your own. But if you have your instrument, grab it. Play along, it'll be fun. So first thing I do is this. I wanna just play each note of each chord. I know this might sound uh, overly simple for some of you, or it might be like, that's too basic, like just play the chord tones, but you'll, you'd be surprised. You need to just play through all the chord tones just so you have a base understanding of, okay, these are the literal tones of each individual chord. Start there. By the way, even if you've had some experience with it, I would go through the entire process step by step because you're gonna end up wasting less time in the long run if you go through the whole process because you're just going step by step by step. If you kind of skip some steps and, and you wanna jump ahead, yeah, you might save time in the short run, but then in the long run, you're like, oh, I don't really know this chord. You're gonna have to go back. You don't wanna do that. Just go through it step by step and then you never really have to worry about it again. So what I'm gonna do right now is play each chord. Just each chord one by one. I might change the range based on how it's written here, just so you know. I'm gonna play each individual chord.
So nothing crazy there. If you know the chord tones of each chord, that's a good starting point. That's a good starting point. Um, <laughs> I had a pink shirt on earlier today, Adele. Because um, on Wednesdays, as we all know, we wear pink. So when you go through the chord tones first, I know that sounds basic, but just go through them out of time, just so you understand and can play all the notes. Because you'd be surprised, sometimes people don't realize what notes are in each chord, so make sure you have the correct chords there. So we have all the chord tones first. Now what we're gonna do is go through an entire course of the blues in time. So when I say in time, I mean either with a metronome or with a backing track. I'm gonna use a backing track so it gives us some harmony. I recommend, you know, getting, by the way, I'm not, this is not a paid sponsorship, but hey, if anybody's out there from iReal Pro, let me know, I use it all the time. Um, but I'm not sponsored by them, I'm not getting paid to say this, but iReal Pro is probably the best bang for your buck you can get for practicing music. Um, I, when I was in high school, even I remember <coughs> illegally <coughs> downloading from like Napster and <coughs> LimeWire and Kazaa downloading Jamie Abersell backing tracks, right? But if you wanted to purchase them <coughs> legally, you had to buy a book with the CD, which is like eight songs for like, you know, 12 bucks. This app is like $15 and you get thousands of songs. So I like to use it. You can also, you know, loop sections, change the tempo, change the key without bothering your friends in the rhythm section to play blues for five hours. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is this. So here's step, here's where if you have your instrument, grab it and let's, uh, let's do this together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through an entire chorus. Okay, so 12 measures, and I'm gonna play the root of each chord first, just the root. So I'm gonna play root and measure one, root, 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 root. So if there's two chords in a measure, I'm gonna play two half notes. If there's one chord in a measure, whole note. When I say root, I mean the one of each chord. So if it's B flat seven, I'm playing the note B flat, E flat seven, I'm playing E flat, so on and so forth. If you could do this in time, what this is gonna do is solidify the chord motion or the chord phrase motion. All the chords in time. How quickly are they moving? People talk about harmonic motion, the chord motion. Same thing when we're talking about how are we moving in time. So let's do that right now. I'm gonna put on the backing track for a blues and it's going to be just the root throughout. I'm gonna do it at 130 beats per minute just to give us some time to think. So here we go, the root of each chord. If you have your instrument, please jump in, play along. Here we go. Okay, so if you're doing this with me right now, I hope you were able to get through it. If you weren't, um, that's step one, basically. Step, well, step two. Step one was just playing the chord tones. So step two is gonna be playing through. <laughs> nice. Copyright laws, blah, blah, blah. I never said, I, I had something in my throat. I, I, I didn't say anything about legality. Uh, we had a good sectional. Good, Adele. Very good. I'm glad you had a good sectional. Um, so after you do that, if you're able to do that, right, and that's like easy for you, the next step is going to be play the third of each chord. So what we're doing here is we're reinforcing the chord phrase motion. Once again, if this seems tedious, it doesn't take that long. I'm just talking a lot in between. If I just went back to back to back, it would only take about a minute to get through all four choruses, maybe two minutes, to play the root, to play each chord tone, which is the direction we're heading. I'm sure you could guess. Just doing this process, though, solidifies where the chords are moving. You hear each chord tone. You can hear all of them in time. And then what happens is this. You're able to then anticipate or pre-hear each of the chords because you've gone through this process over and over and over again. I'm not just diving in trying to solo because here's the problem. When you look at a new song, if you're not super comfortable with it and you, the first time you look at the changes, you try soloing, you only have a certain amount of bandwidth to think about. If you're looking at new chord changes, you have to talk about, you have to think about the new chord changes and the roadmap of the tune. But also if you're improvising, you're thinking about 
you know, lines and scales and chords and licks and substitutions and alterations and interacting with the band and your dynamics and your articulation, your tone quality. Simplify things, chord tone at a time. So this time let's play through and play the third of each chord. Same thing, whole note or half note, but let's play the third of each chord. Okay, so now we're through the third. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome, images and words. Um, so now once you play the third, next step, play the fifth. By the way, if, if playing the third was tricky or it was harder to do, especially because it's stacked out, if you wanna write them out, you'll see in the PDF I, on the next page how they're written out, but I'm gonna get there in a minute. But it's good to try to see the chord and think of the chord tone. We're also training ourselves to think of the chord tones as opposed to simply reading them. Because if you always read notes when we're talking about improvisation, then when you actually go to improvise, you're gonna be thinking about an image of those notes. You're not gonna be hearing the notes and really internalizing them. So get off the page as, as quickly as you can. Now, in the beginning, absolutely read it, get it under your fingers first, but then try to get off the page and say, okay, I'm gonna look away. Can I play the third of every chord? Can I play the root of every chord? And that's the goal. Okay, and the goal is to internalize it. Also, if you do this process first and third, and then as you see five and seven, every repetition is gonna make it solidify even more. Remember, repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. <laughs> um, and every time you go through, it's gonna you know, build up that finger pattern, build up that memory pattern, and you're gonna hear those chords, and you're gonna be able to anticipate these chords, so when you actually go to improvise in a little bit, you'll be able to hear the chords ahead of time, so pre-hear them. So here we go, we're gonna play the fifth of every chord now, the fifth, so it's a third note up, fifth of every chord. Okay, now that you're able to play the fifth, hopefully, now we're gonna jump up to the seventh. We're gonna jump up to the seventh, okay? So just understand that once you get away from one, three, and five, and you start to play the seventh, because of the nature of the seventh, especially over dominant chords, it sounds not resolved, okay? What I mean by that is when you just land on a flat seven of a chord, even if it's a chord tone, it always wants to go somewhere whether it's a minor or a dominant seven, for the most part, it feels like it wants to lead somewhere else. So when you do this, understand it's gonna give you that feeling, but as long as you know you're playing the right notes, it is correct, uh, but just understand what the feeling of each of these notes is. And that also helps you when you're improvising, because then when you go to choose which notes to solo on, you already have that knowledge of, well, just because it's a chord tone doesn't mean they're all gonna feel the same way. Jacob Collier has this whole thing about how each note feels, or each chord, the emotion of it, right? So it's the same kind of deal. The third is gonna be very rock solid. Fifth is gonna be rock solid. The root is gonna be solid but boring. And the seventh has a lot of color, but a lot of time it has that unresolved feeling like it wants to go somewhere. If it was a major seven, it's actually much more resolved, which is interesting because it's only a half step away from the root, but we'll get into that another day. So here we go. I'm gonna play through the seventh of every chord now. Right, so you hear that? It doesn't, it almost sounds wrong. I don't wanna say wrong, but it, it definitely has tension. Um, it's a chord tone, 
But because you're highlighting that seventh in the way seventh to third motion usually works, it always feels like it wants to go somewhere. Um, I just want to let you know that your YouTube jazz material has been extremely helpful. Build it, break it, fix it. Are you a car person? Because that sounds like a car uh, thing. If so, awesome. Uh, but thank you. I'm, I'm glad. Images and words. Oh, you didn't have to. Can't spare much. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you sending that. That definitely much appreciated, not um, required. But I appreciate it. I'll buy a cup of coffee tomorrow with that. Thank you. Um, awesome. So now, now that we've played through the root, the third, the fifth, and seventh, if you've done this, you've at least now played through the blues or whatever song. Remember, this is for any song. So if the song has extensions, you might want to go one more chorus and play all the ninths or elevenths or whatever you want. But I'm sticking to just four chord tones. Um, then you would go on to you would go on to the next page of the PDF. So I'm going to scroll down here. So I want, if you have your PDF, please get it out. Now, look what we have. So I wrote out the chords. So this would be, if you were actually just playing each note like above, this would be easier probably to read, but I'm, uh, I wanted to just leave it as the stacked chords. So now we have the chords in root position. Root position means starting on the one at the bottom. So if, you're, if you play piano, you know what root position is because that's the root of the chord of the one and then three, five, seven above it. So on a saxophone or a trumpet or an instrument where you play one note at a time, we have to play them as individual notes going up. So after you've played through four choruses of whatever song you're doing, in this case it's a blues, you play just the root first chorus, just the third for the second chorus, just the fifth on the third chorus, just the seventh on the fourth chorus. Now I want you to go through the entire chorus again but play every chord tone over every chord. So I wrote them out here exactly how you would play them in root position first. So if it's a four beat chord, like B flat seven is here in measure one, it would be four chord, quarter notes, right? Measure two is four quarter notes. Now measure four is where it gets a little tricky because you have two chords. Each chord only gets two full beats, so you have to break them down into eighth notes, which gets a little tricky, especially when we go to some of the inversions. So here's what this sounds like. So once you get through one chorus of one note per chorus, one chorus of one note uh, in each chord, then you go into all root position chords. So here's what this sounds like at the same tempo. So here's where speed comes into play, all right? Tempo comes into play. If we're playing through this and we have eighth notes and stuff, you hear how quick they are. And that was only in root position. That's the easiest of the bunch. So if we have, you know, a song with a lot of chords in it, obviously you're going to have to make some adjustments and some modifications. If you have a song where there's multiple, like three chords in a measure and it's still quick, you know... 16th notes if you want, or just slow it way down or kind of work on that measure separately, whatever you want to do. But this process works for most songs and most jazz songs. If, if you have any songs where there's chords on like quarter notes, usually that's going to be a ballad anyway. So you'll be able to play 16th notes uh, because the tempo is going to be probably pretty slow. So if you're able to play root position, scroll down on the PDF. What do you have? First inversion. So first inversion of a chord means the third is now on the bottom and the, the root or the one is up top. Same four notes of each individual chord. The difference is now we're inverting the, the actual placement of the chord. Some of you that are more seasoned improvisers or at least have gone through at least something like this in the past, once again, you might be asking, well, this is teaching me to play vertically. Don't you always say to play horizontally and not vertically? Yes, but you have to know what this is first. Okay, you have to know what the chord tones are when they happen in a song this is, this is about learning a song, right? Outlining chord changes is not building vocabulary in the sense of we're exploring new ideas. This is just learning what's in front of us. I, I was given this lead sheet. I have to learn this song. I have to play an audition and solo over this song, and I don't know. I've never seen this song before. I don't really know a lot of... I know some scales and a couple chords, but I don't know. Here's what you do. Because this not only helps with the literal chord tones, but like I said earlier, this helps with hearing the whole roadmap of the tune. You're going to start to anticipate it. If you go through this whole process, if you look at the sheet, 
if you don't do any redos, if you do everything first take, you'll have a chorus for the root, chorus for the third, chorus for the fifth, chorus for the seventh. Chorus for root position, first inversion, second inversion, third inversion. So by the end of this, you'll have gone through this eight times with intention. And that's the thing about practicing I think is really important, intentional practice. 10 minutes of intentional practice is worth way more than an hour of unintentional practice. An hour of just, oh, I'm just gonna like play whatever and just do this and play, play stuff I already know, whatever. 10 minutes of, now, 10 minutes of focused intentional practice is worth more than that. Not to say you, you shouldn't just have fun when you're practicing and play things you like, but that's not really practicing and getting better at something, okay? So if you're able to go through root position, let's go through first inversion. Once again, if you have your instrument, grab it. Play along with me, see if you can do it. And then let me know in the comments if you have your instrument. That swing is so laid back and organic. Uh, what swing? Of the backing track or the way I'm playing quarter notes? Because <laughs> if it's the backing track, that's very funny uh, that you say that. <laughs> I like it. Here we go. First inversion. By the way, I love that this is live. So if I make a mistake, you're gonna hear it. Um, so you can, you know, a lot of people are hide behind doing multiple takes of things. And you're following along with their guitar. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We keeping up, boss, good. Uh, guilty of unintentional practice sometimes. That's okay, that's totally fine. But just make sure you understand that if you're going in with the thought to get better, make sure it's intentional. It's okay to just have fun and play things that you like. That's totally cool. Um, I mean, listen, I'm so guilty of unintentional practice, um, but that's why I like intentional practice because I try to make it as focused as possible so I can super quickly get done what I need to get done so then I can just jam and play whatever. <laughs> so and I'm, I'm not gonna go on a rant right now, but I can totally go on a rant about people doing 8,000 takes before they post something or before they do whatever. Um, not only is it just like not realistic because you know, if you play in real life, you're gonna have to play on stage and you're not gonna get a second take, but it always gives you that safety net. I implore you, put out things that aren't as perfect, you know, in the beginning just because it's first take, but even if you don't like it as much, it'll teach you to get better at the first take. I always like what I play first take more than anything else. I, 99% of the videos you guys have seen on the internet of me, edited videos are first take solos. Second take, I usually, I start thinking about what I played in the first take and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna try to play that line again. Oh, I'm gonna try to play that high note and it's not as organic and I mess up and whatever else. Um, got my YDS, was much faster than setting up. <laughs> YDS, what's that? Sorry, your intonation is awesome. Oh, thank you. That intonation is something I always struggle with, especially with headphones on, it's hard to hear. But uh, yeah, all right, so here we go. So we just did first inversion. Let's go down to second inversion. So now the five is on the bottom. So by this point, you've played through a bunch of courses of one, cor one note per chord, now a bunch, two courses of all four chord tones. You should start to be hearing where those two fives are, start hearing the motion of these chords. So here's what this sounds like. If sharp didn't want to pop out. <laughs> okay, so um, how do you get better at rhythm and swinging? Yeah, so that's, well, that's another Yamaha digital saxophone. Oh, whoa. I never tried one of those. Are they, are they cool? Is it like a Iwi? Is that the thing that Charlie Rosen and Grace Kelly did the commercial for Yamaha? Is that the thing? Or is that something else? Whatever. Can't get into it now. Um, 
how do you get better at rhythm and swinging? So I'm not going to go into that now. I'm going to talk about that in a future thing. But um, listening is, is for that specifically, just listen, listen, listen. Um, I have something incredibly exciting coming. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't mean to hit that. Um, crazy thing that I've never done before that is big, 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 big thing. <clears throat> that I, It's super big. But I address that. And there's a process that I like to go through for what I call reference recordings um, for to really help with rhythm swinging or any style you're playing in, not just swing, but for rhythms, phrasing, articulation, dynamics. Um, I have a whole thing on that, um, which, uh, which will be part of this big <clears throat> thing that I can't tell you anything about or when <clears throat> it's coming up. So, oh, Sandiata, thank you so much. That was really uh, nice of you. I appreciate that. Man, I'm going to go out to lunch tomorrow now. You just, you just got me lunch, I think. I'm not eating some boring chicken and rice anymore. I'm gonna go out and get some good food now. <laughs> there are loads of bands I would love to have a digital sax on board. Yeah, people love that stuff. I would love to play one, I just don't have one. So Yamaha, if you're out there, send me one, or Iwi, or whatever. Somebody send me one. <laughs> uh, I'll do a review, or I'll, I don't know, I'll promote it or something. Only if it's good, though. If it's garbage, I'll just send it back. Okay, <laughs> jumping back into the PDF. Back into the PDF. Uh, let's go to the final one. So now this is third inversion. So the interesting thing about this, if you notice now the flat seven or the, just the seven in this song, it happens to be flat seven, but the seven's on the bottom. So you're gonna have a short interval between the seven and the one. It's either gonna be a whole step or in the case of the diminished chord, a minor third. But uh, if you have major seven, it would only be a half step. So it's gonna be a little tricky. At least tricky for me. So here we go. Third inversion, play along. Don't you hate when the rhythm section just keeps playing longer than you want to? Ha ha ha, I'm so funny, I know. What backing track are you using in iReal Pro? I'm using the one called Blues-Jazz, and uh, the style is Jazz Medium Up Swing 2, and using a Rhodes instead of the piano sound. I hate the piano sound. Acoustic bass, Rhodes 2, and drums. Those are the settings. 130 BPM. Okay. Holy cow, horrible instrument. Hey, Skip, what's going on? Horrible instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's up, man? Uh, hey, Dave, your stuff. Sorry I missed the beginning. Oh, it's okay. It's going to be on here. So the great thing about this, and for everybody watching, um, is this gets archived like a regular video. This is not going anywhere. Uh, it's not being privated. It's just going to stay here on my channel so you can watch it um, whenever you want, as much as you want afterwards. So it'll be here right after. Um, it had a unique scale. Sing intervals of each chord during the outline process. So that's up to you. So Sandiata asks, if you didn't see, would you suggest singing the intervals? Um, maybe, for me, honestly, for me, uh, it's just easier if I play them. I'd rather whistle them personally because I can't sing in tune to save my life. So it's almost going to hurt uh, my ear. Like, I'm going to sing it out of tune and it's not going to lock up as much. So I like to play it on the instrument that I'm playing. But if you want to sing, that does help internalize it. Absolutely go for it. Um, but for when I'm talking about specific notes, I like to sing when I'm talking about um, interaction and rhythms and phrasing and stuff and articulation that I like to sing for that because it's not reliant on my skills as a singer. When I'm talking about something like this where I'm trying to outline chord changes and notes, if I'm not a good singer, you might be, so do it. Um, I wouldn't do it personally, but that's just me. So, so far we've gone through, if we go back to the top here, and you have this PDF. If you don't have this, go to the top of the description. Click the link, get your free PDF. If you're on my email list, you already got this sent to you. So we did one note per chord, then we did the root positions all the way through. So we did eight choruses already. Really quick, I'm gonna do an analysis of the blues and I'm actually gonna just solo over it so you can hear it. Um, 
because a lot of people were asking about the analysis, and, and I'm not completely done about talking about outlining chord chains. I will get back to it in a second. But the key of the, the song is B-flat. It's a B-flat blues, so that's why I put one. Remember, when I say key, I don't mean key signature because the key signature of B-flat is two flats. It a blues is dominant seven chords we're focusing on. So whenever I talk about improvisation, I'm always talking about function. What's the function of the chord? And that's gonna be very evident when I get to bar three and or four and five, because somebody asked me about that. So I start on the one chord, and then what's E flat seven? It doesn't function in any different way. What I mean by that is when I talk about function of chords, this isn't an analyzing um, songs or analyzing chords uh, live stream, but I did wanna just talk about it. I have a whole crazy thing about analyzing songs in this really <coughs> crazy thing that <coughs> I don't can't talk about and I don't know when <coughs> it's going to be available it's like the biggest thing I've ever done <coughs> but you know <coughs> sorry there's something in my throat okay so um but yeah so that's that so one up to the four chord and then we go back to the one chord when I talk about function I'm talking about pockets of changes are, are there cadences are there turnarounds Two five ones, one six two five ones, three six two five ones, you know, chromatic motion, whatever. So one up to four, back to one. There's no relation between those. Bar four, we have F minor to B flat seven. Okay, so that's a minor five to the, to the one. No. <laughs> yes, if you analyze it compared to the one, but that doesn't give you any function. People who analyze it like that are usually doing so on paper with their pinkies out. We are musicians. We, we create sounds. What is the function of F minor seven to B flat seven? The answer is that is a two five in the key of E flat major. So it functions as a two five in the key of E flat major. Now, don't worry about the chord that comes next. The chord that comes next doesn't have to exist. It could be F major, it could be B flat major, it could be Z natural flat five. The point is this is a two five one, or two five in E flat major. It happens to resolve to an E flat, dominant seven, not E flat major, so you can treat this as a two, five, one in E flat. Just understand if you want to resolve to the seven, it has to be D flat, not D natural. Someone asked me, why didn't I write four here? Because that is, this chord is part of the measure before it. A two, five, one itself is a turnaround. It is a chord phrase. In this <clears throat> thing that I have coming and I go through in super in depth with a million different things, um, but I have this, when I talk about analyzing songs and talking about phrases, the function of the phrases is the most important thing. I recently did a masterclass that a lot of you watched um, on giant steps, and I talked about the function of giant steps, five, one, five, one, right? The function of the chords is when you look deeper at their meaning so you can then more efficiently improvise through them. If you think of this as minor five, one, four dominant, that, that means nothing. That doesn't mean anything. That's just describing what it is. You know, it's not telling you how it works, what it sounds like, how you should approach it. That just tells you kind of at the base level what it is. When you look at the function of it, oh, it's a two, five, one in E flat. I have a whole masterclass on two, five, ones. Go check that out as well. It's on YouTube as well. Okay, so after this, this is functioning as a one chord. Now we go up to this diminished chord. I wouldn't call it sharp one because we're not. it's not really in the key of E flat. It's just a passing diminished chord. Passing diminished chords are great because diminished chords are symmetrical chords, minor thirds built up. So I called it the four diminished seven, or the sharp four diminished seven, I should say. That should say sharp four, not just four there, okay? Um, so when you have the sharp four diminished seven, I apologize for that. I will correct it in the future PDF. Um, it's just passing diminished. It doesn't really have a function in a chord phrase. It's a passing chord. Back to the one. Now, you might say, why didn't you write two, five, one here? D minor to G to C. I could have, and actually the function when you play this should be a minor two, five, one in the key of C minor, but the overall function here is a three, six, two, five, one in the key of B flat major. When I talk about three, six, two, five, one, that is its own unit. Three, six, two, five, one, three, six, two, five, one. Now, when you break that down, how do you break down a three, six, two, five, one? You would go inside and say, oh, this is a minor two, five, one to C minor. Then as soon as it lands on C minor, the function switches from a one minor one to a two chord, and then you have a major two, five, one in B flat, okay? But the overall function is three, six, two, five, one. Understand that it's three, six, two, five, one. Then there's the micro analysis of within the three, six, two, five, one. Then look at the end. One, six, two, five, one is once again, its own thing. Within it, this G7 to C minor functions as a five to one in C minor. 
The reason why I didn't write five one is because this is part of the overall chord phrase of one, six, two, five, and then one back at the top. Understanding the overall chord phrases, three, six, two, five, one, one, six, two, five, one. And then you have to do some work within there with the phrase, but it's more beneficial for you to look at that as an entire one, six, two, five, one phrase or three, six, two, five, one phrase. Okay. Um, so does that make sense? If you have any questions on anything I've gone over so far, please let me know in the comments. Um, I don't know why I'm wearing those. So getting back to just outlining the chords, because I just want to take a break from that for a second. I am going to play the tune and just blow over it in a minute. Um, but when you're looking at new chord changes, there is a bunch of steps that need to go in place for you to be able to improvise effectively through them. There's a lot of people out there that say, just feel it, man, just transcribe and just like play lines that you hear. And like, you know, if you don't understand these basics, you're just always going to be parroting and trying to color by numbers. And you're going to wait for a certain song that has certain chords and just input some lick that you learned. You're not going to actually know how to do it yourself. Okay. I'm teaching you to be a, a chef to create your own recipes and understand how ingredients work. I'm not teaching you to just blindly follow a recipe. Okay. That has its merit too. And that, that has uses too, but I'm with this, I'm teaching you how to actually understand the ingredients, the notes and the chords and understand how to put them together. This masterclass, once again, is strictly for the most part, <laughs> sort of strictly about outlining chord changes. I went into the analysis there a little bit, but that's just because I wrote it there and I wanted you to understand it. So, um, what's the next step? Well, the next step would then be to go to the voice leading process. Go through that voice leading process that I have, the six step process. And in that one, I didn't go through everything. I didn't go through every chromatic thing and every non-diatonic line and chromatic enclosure and chromatic leading tone. But I wish there was something out there that, um, that really went into depth with all that stuff. <clears throat> Sorry, my hand keeps hitting over here. I, I wish there was something out there that really went into deep detail about all those processes and demonstrated on multiple different songs. Um, oh, my hand, see, it's so weird. Okay, so I'm now gonna blow over these changes. So you would, you would go over outlining those chords. If you can do everything I did so far, you know the tune, you know where the, the harmony is moving, and then you would analyze it and hopefully understand that little bit of it. Then you would voice lead through it. How do I use these chord tones to then horizontally move between one another to make melodic solos? Then it's filling in those lines, doing those sample lines, and then talking about all those non-note musical elements and lots of other things um, that I'm gonna get into another time. So I'm just going to play a blues now because, you know, talking about jazz is, well, it's talking about jazz. Why? Well, let's do jazz. Let's play some jazz. So I'm going to speed it up a little just uh, for my own enjoyment <laughs> and hopefully yours. So the same, I'm using the same backing track. So same blues, jazz, backing track, and B flat. The only difference is, like I said, I'm speeding up just a hair. Once again, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat. I'd love to hear them. Or if you have any comments, questions about Anything soloing, let me know. And uh, without any further ado, let's blow a little bit and uh, let's see.
Here we go. <clears throat> to the rousing applause of my room. <laughs> so, Adler, how do you how do you say your name? Adler Crowley. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, you probably realize I should have put it on uh, on here. Uh, instead of still having it on the PDF, but hey, all good. We are here. So, I hope uh, so far you're staying with me. One stack, one says, sick. No, I actually feel great. Haha, <laughs> I'm so funny. Um, maybe I should just do a stand-up set. So, funny story. I think it's funny. Um, I played a gig up in Brooklyn, New York City uh, a couple weeks ago. And I got there early. I got there early, right? Um, and I I never been to this place before. And I go inside, and it's like a bar type thing. Venue, though. And on the stage, there was it was just stand up comedy. <laughs> stand up, and someone had their phone, and like, and they were up for like two minutes, and then they're like, "All right, next up is you know John, whatever." And I realized it was just like an open mic comedy night. And uh, some of them were really bad, like not funny. Like there's probably 25 people in there and like <laughs> one was laughing. Um, so I remember uh, sitting there and I was, I got there so early. I was, you know, I had like 45 minutes before we were even supposed to set up or start. So I guess that was 45 minutes more of comedy. And I was, I didn't know how it worked, but I was very close to getting up on that stage and telling some jokes. Cause I know I could have gotten some more laughs um, than some of them got. <laughs> Oh, that was very funny. I didn't do it though. Um, I have a lot of music musician jokes, but I have a lot of regular jokes too. All right, so let me answer a couple questions here. So uh, I heard tones of blues language in those lines. What recordings and albums could I go to to learn some of that language? So a lot of my blues stuff um, and like just swinging, what I'm trying to like swing is Cannonball. Um, so anything that Cannonball has played, Cannonball Adderley has played um, is good <laughs> for that. Honestly, just listen to any of his stuff. And that's a lot of where I got my articulation and uh, overall kind of phrasing and shape of solos and dynamics and stuff like that is from Cannonball, from the way he did it, um, combined with some other people. But that's really the, the, the starting point uh, for me, anyway. Um, Vincenzo says... Oh, tones of, yeah, tons of, sorry. Uh, hello, Dave, great content. Does ever happen to you, ever happen to you to have a desynchronization of your ears and hands when you are tired and how you solve it? If, um, it's, uh, when I'm tired? Maybe, yeah, I mean, it happens, you know, sometimes. I try to never get to that point. If, if I'm, you know, I try to never put myself in that situation to get to that point. If I'm just playing, like now, normally it won't happen. If I'm if I'm tired to the point where that's going on, I, I if I don't have to play, then I just won't play. Now, if I'm on a gig and I happen to be that tired, I don't know. You just got to fight through it and just focus. Uh, drink more coffee, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I I think I understand what you're saying. But I try to just not ever let my girl, myself get to that point. You know, um, of where I'm just like playing stuff and it's just things aren't lining up and whatever. Um, but yeah, I just. If, if I did, to solve it, I guess, I don't know. You got to just put yourself... It's just like any physical activity. If you're really tired, mentally, physically, um, you know, it's it's that's tough, yeah. So you just got to hopefully prepare so you're not in that position. I don't know really how to solve it. Sorry. Um, so before I just take other random questions... By the way, you starting now, if you have any random questions for me, go for it. It doesn't have to be about outlining chord changes. Let's just open it up for a QA. and a um, just, I'm going to dive back into the PDF just for a second because I just want to explain just for some of you that want to take this further and you want to practice this on your own. Um, so when you're looking at this sheet and you have this one at home, and remember, if you don't have this already, please go to the, the link in the top of the description down below. Get your free PDF. It's uh, this one right here, but make sure you download your instrument. There's one for C, treble, uh, C, bass clef, and then B flat, E flat. When you go through this, understand that this process that I wrote out is only on the jazz blues 
you can go through this exact process on any song you want. You could take blank staff paper and write out the chord tones first. Play through the chord tones out of time so you know all the notes. Then put on a track or a metronome and go through each chorus, four choruses. You can do them in a row. You don't have to stop like I did. First course, you play only the root. Second course, only the third. Third course, only the fifth. Fourth course, only the seventh. If you want an in between that and this next thing, you can just do like, okay, this course, I'll play the one and the three. So like half notes here in measure one, B flat, D, E flat, G, something like that. You can do that. Um, but I just skipped to playing all four chord tones here. But you can do any combination. You can do root and five, three and seven of each one if you want. But just so you, the idea of this, this process of starting with playing it out of time, playing one chord tone in time, it's all about playing it in time so you can apply the practice to your improvisation. I explained this in the beginning, but so many teachers teach things that aren't directly applicable. I wanna teach, everything I teach is not busy work. Everything I teach is has a function, right? So if I'm teaching improvisation, if I'm telling you to play chord tones, it's because I want you to play them in time so you can know what the chord tones are, know what the notes are, voice lead between them and pre-hear the chords to anticipate the next chord. So when you're improvising in real time, you have already heard that so many times and you anticipate those chords, you're not surprised. Like there's a reason why I do it this way. I'm not just saying, okay, play the chord tones in full range of the instrument out of time and do this and it, I don't know, like some of that stuff can help, but I think this is the best way to really just internalize the tune without adding a lot of extra steps. Some people might say, okay, you see B flat seven, play mixolydian in measure one and mixolydian in measure two. Smack your teacher if they tell you to do that. Not actually, I don't condone violence. Mentally smack your teacher. Because the idea of chords equal scales just makes my skin crawl. Sometimes it can work, but the problem is it's not all the time, so you can't just blanket say, anytime you see a dominant seven, play a mixolydian scale. No. Maybe it might work, but if you don't understand why certain notes work and why certain notes don't work, that's not gonna help you. That's just gonna be coloring by numbers. Now you're just throwing in random scales. It's like if I said, here, play this lick over 251. Well, it might work, but it might give me the wrong sound, the wrong shape, whatever. Um, so go through this whole process and try to play them in first and The real test is if you can do this, you ready? Do an eight chorus, put it on for eight choruses. First four choruses, play one chord tone for each. Then chorus five, root position. Chorus six, first inversion. Chorus seven, second inversion. Chorus eight, third inversion. See if you can do it perfectly, perfectly. As in, don't miss the high F sharp like I did on alto. Okay, I missed a note, so I didn't play it perfectly. I missed uh, that note right there. Th second inversion, the very last note I missed. So that, I would have to start at the beginning, not perfect, okay? Do it perfectly. When you go to voice lead after that, it's gonna be so much easier so much easier for you to be able to uh, connect those chords together because you've played them so many times in all different inversions, okay? The other thing about this that I think is so crucial is that you're learning the equal amount of root position and inversions. When you're improvising, you shouldn't just always start on the root and say, oh, I'm gonna play a scale starting on the root or I'm gonna play chord tone starting on the root. Yes, that's great and I wanted you to do that, but equal, equally, I wanted you to practice starting on the third, starting on the fifth and starting on the seventh. You should be able to start on any point of any chord in any song, that's how you get that melodic voice leading because you can't restart. The idea of vertical playing is you're playing something, oh, I have to go to E flat major, boop, drop down to the root. Oh, drop down to F. No, this way, no matter where you're at in the horn, you're never more than a whole step or minor third at the most away from another chord tone in the, the next chord. That's the thought process there. Okay, let me jump into some of these questions. Um, again, hi Dave, do jazz players play what they hear in their heads because that's so hard to do? Yeah. So once again, I wish there was something that took you a step-by-step -step process that got you to that point where you can just think about the more important parts of improvisation, like articulation dynamics, interacting with the band, phrasing. I wish there was <clears throat> something that got you <clears throat> to that point. <clears throat> Why does my can't hand keep doing that? I don't know. Um, you know, it's yes. The answer is yes. If, if anybody tells you, Great improvisers just make everything up on the spot. They just play what they feel. They they either are lying to you or they don't know how to improvise themselves because that's not true. Improvising is creating melodies over a certain parameter or certain parameters over a song. Unless we're talking about completely free music where you just play random stuff, that's different. That's not what I'm talking I'm talking about somewhat structured jazz playing. So it's not necessarily playing in your head as if you have something pre-written in your head, but as I'm playing, I do what's called formative assessment. It's a teacher term. Formative assessment means as I'm playing, I'm listening to myself and I'm critiquing myself and saying, okay, 
what's the musical situation? Okay, I'm playing a medium swing blues. How, are, what's the articulation? Oh, is the piano player playing pointed articul like art chords, articulating them? Or is he holding chords out? Is he, oh, is the drummer giving me a triplet rhythm? In real time, I'm thinking about all those elements and I'm also saying, okay, what did I just play? Oh, I played a bluesy line. Did the bluesy line work? Yes. Should I play more of it or go away from it? It's like doing a lot of processes really quickly. Remember, improvising is composing in real time. Composing is improvising with the pause button. So the best way to get to it is learn all these basics. Learn everything I'm teaching you in all these master classes and in something really big I have <clears throat> coming soon um, that goes through in way more depth than I've ever gone to on YouTube uh, times 100. <laughs> um, you, you learn all those basics because then you build that all up. That's, that's learning how to walk, okay? That's learning how to put one foot in front of the other. When you're actually walking across the room as an adult, hopefully you don't have to think about that. You can just think about the goal in mind, which is grab that bottle of water over there. You don't think about walking there. Just like I say, okay, oh, right now I wanna play outside, I wanna play a tritone substitution sound. To me, that's as easy as saying, I wanna grab that bottle of water. I don't have to think about walking there. I don't have to think now about how to get that tritone sub sound. I just know that I want to hear that sound. If you're painting and you're like, you know what? Oh, I wanna put a tree there. You don't have to think about how to draw a tree. The only thought is, do I want a tree there or not? And that's the great thing about improvisation. Once you have all these skills in your skill set, you don't have to think about how to construct the skill or how to build that idea. All you have to do is think of the idea. That comes from listening a lot, interacting with the band a lot, and then thinking about what things fit in certain situations. And then trial and error. Trial and error and trial and error and trial and error. I know it's a long answer, but that's what it is. Your students are lucky to have you as a teacher. I hope they realize. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I'm a high school band director, for those who don't know. I was an elementary and middle school band director for the, uh, from 2011, fall of 2011 until January of 2022. Since January, I've been a high school band director, doing jazz bands and all that. So do they realize? I don't know. Maybe not, but that's not the point. But I appreciate it. I hope they realize just, I hope they just listen to me and, uh, you know, get better. That's the goal. It's not about me being good or whatever. It's, it's about them learning and getting better. Um, okay, hold on. Uh, I talked a lot on that one. Sounding good. I noticed you use a tenor madness line to start your phrase a couple times. I think that was a cool technique, something familiar while introducing something unfamiliar. Yeah, use of motifs, right? Talking about motifs. I wish there was something out there that broke down actually how to use motifs in your playing. <clears throat> I wish there was something out there that broke down how to use motifs in your playing and, and dissect them and talk about it and build it up because motifs are a great way. Motif is a small fragment, a repeatable idea that hooks people in and then you can go from it. Um, it's just a, usually a melodic or rhythmic idea. Um, your student, uh, do you private online classes and how much do you charge for that? So send me an email because um, I do, but I also have something, like I said, uh, big coming. But I do, so send me an email, uh, info at davepollock.com or davepollockmusic at gmail.com, either one. Bob says, one of my first jazz books is play saxophone like Cannibal Adderley. Yeah. Step one, play saxophone like Cannibal Adderley. Step two, make millions of dollars. <laughs> uh, if only that easy, uh, play like, yeah. Dave, do you think that when playing tenor or alto, you should definitely focus on one? What solution did you find? So for me... I tried to play both and I realized that I'm an alto player. Alto is my voice on the saxophone. Um, I played in a, like a pop band on tenor for years, but that's just because they wanted tenor. I, I'm not a tenor player. Um, nobody calls me to play tenor gigs, very rarely. They understand I'm an alto player. I mean, I play tenor, I have one in the back. I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's not mine, I've been borrowing it for about eight years from my friend Matt. <laughs> Shout out to Matt Janiszewski for letting me borrow his ten, Con 10M ten for the last eight years. I don't own that one. Um, I, so it's up to you. If you own both, if you want to play both, you can totally play both. It's not like one is going to hinder the other. Personally, I just like alto way more. And I think there's way too many tenor players that already sound great and not nearly as many alto players. So I stuck to alto. Also, playing tenor is like bowling with bumpers. It's like super easy to get a good sound and play lines and it fits perfectly. Alto actually takes more skill. Hot take. There we go. Uh, for, for beginners just from playing a long time, our hands already know diatonic, pentatonic, melodic, chromaticism. Is it safe to say that I can start this two five one structure on the third and start ends the following measure on the third? Yeah. So I don't know if you saw my survival line video or my two five one masterclass. I talk about this line where you play um, 
start on the third of the two chord. And if it's a long two, five, one, like a full measure of the two, a full measure of the five, and then resolve to one, you can start on the third of the two chord and scale down diatonically in the key. So the key of the one, you'll hit the third, third, third. And that's a great way to practice um, building up two, five, one sounds by starting with a diatonic line. Yeah. Check out my two, five, one master class. I talk about the survival line. I also have a specific video on the survival line. That's what it is. Third, 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 third. And there's also seventh to third motion in there. It's really cool. Um, I found this interesting geometry the other day. What? <laughs> I found this interesting geometry the other day. It works for major and minor chords. Okay. What's the geometry? However you hear the music will always be there. And so will the classic licks. If you, well, if you listen without the fun fundamentals, it will never come together. So saxophonic, saxophonic. I like that. Oh, that's pretty good. Saxophonic. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like people love to just say transcribe and transcribing is great, but like transcribing without understanding why those sounds sound the way they do and why they work. It, you're just, you're never going to really n know it. You're just going to be just playing someone else's stuff. Um, and you're never going to understand how to create your own stuff based on that stuff, right? You're just going to be a copycat, which is fine if that's what you want, but there's so many limitations to that. And it, it does, it just seems like not fun to me anyway. Uh, let's see. Improv advice for newer advice for newer improvisers and how to efficiently learn one through five, seven without having to write it or think it or think mechanically as in here is the scale and I have to skip every note. Um, well, understand the, f the three main seventh chords, major seven, dominant seven, minor seven. Understand that the major seven is the one, three, five, seven of a key. So you don't have to think of it as a scale skipping notes, but just understand one, three, five, seven of a key. And you just have to repeat that. There, there's no like work around here for this. So I would start in the key of C major. What's the one, three, five, seven of C, C, E, G, B. Then you could say, okay, either go through all 12 major seven chords like that and get them all down. Then say, okay, dominant seven is one, three, five, flat seven. So in the key of C, it's C, E, G, B flat. For F, it'd be F, A, C, E flat. For G, it'd be G, B, D, F natural. You have to just understand what the alterations are. So major seven, no alterations based on the major key. Dominant seven has a flat seven. So I don't base things off of mixolydian scales or minor scales. I base everything off of major key. So for me, I say a minor seven chord is one flat three, five flat seven based on its major key. For example, D minor seven is D F A C. D is the one, F natural is the flat third because F sharp, you flat, you get F natural. A is the fifth and C natural is the flat seven. So you just have to go through and understand all the three types. And then from there, we have alterations and extensions and stuff. I wish there was something that went through all the chords, major, minor, dominant, you know, and went through all the extensions with diminished seven chords and half diminished and six chords and sus chords. And I'm surprised nobody's asked me about that yet. That's good. I'm not going to give you an answer, but I'm surprised nobody's even put it in the comments. Uh, hey, Dave, it feels like I can play the correct notes, but I can't connect them or truly outline them. Okay. Have you checked out, and I know I keep promoting this stuff, but the reason why I put out master classes and put out stuff is so I don't have to keep repeating myself. I can just point you to this thing and it gives you the answer that I've been teaching for years. Check out my melodic solos master class. It's the second link in the description down below. It talks about taking chord tones, knowing the right notes, but how to connect them horizontally, then building your own phrases within them and creating your own lines and your own sounds with good voice leading, which good voice leading will make any song over any changes sound good. Um, what could be the reason why I find more difficult playing low notes on tenor than on alto? It just, wait, more difficult than tenor or alto or Barry? Whoa, so Barry is easier than tenor? Obviously horns are technically right. Are you sure they are? Um, it could be the mouthpiece size and the reed. That's a big one too. If you have a harder reed or the reed's too hard, um, it's gonna be harder to get the low notes or the mouthpiece tip opening is too big. I play small stuff. So I play on alto a five medium. I don't know what the chamber is, but it's a five tip opening with a three reed. On tenor, it's a seven double star. That's giant for me, but some people play eights or nines uh, with like a three or two and a half reed. So make sure your setup is not too heavy. Heavier setups, like a harder reed and bigger tip opening does not mean you're better. So many people think that and it's not the case. So make check that, I would check that. Um, how do I transition into thinking more big picture Roman numerals instead of just notes and keys? Um, no, it's keys. Well, it, it's about digging deep with the, it, it's about literally looking at it and saying, what is the function of each chord? 
um, and saying to yourself, could these chords function together in some way? And there's not a 100% right answer because sometimes you might think things function together when other people are just like, oh, it's a chromatic passing chord, but you might say, well, the function is blah, blah, blah. So I think it's more about finding pockets of phrases. Also use your ear. If you hear that there's, oh, this section is in one key, or this section sounds like these chords are leading to a, a resolution spot, look at the chords and say, okay, where's the resolution? Are the chords before it actually leading there? How are they leading chromatically? Is it a two, five, one? Is it a, a tritone sub? Is it a cult, you know, whatever it is, start to see the pockets of chords and the chord phrases and how they interact with one another and find those pockets. Find, and I keep saying the word pockets, but I mean groups, groups of chords. How do I, um, really interesting and practical, Dave. That's my goal, is practical and hopefully interesting and somewhat funny. If I ask, do you rate Art Pepper? If I ask, do you rate? He seems to be overlooked. I love Art Pepper. Uh, I love Art Pepper the way he plays. It's a relaxed style. A lot of people kind of compare him to the Paul Desmond style, but it's a lot more, a lot more of that bop influence with a lot uh, heavier approach. Not a lot heavier, but a lot more punch to it than, than a Paul Desmond. Uh, I love Art Pepper's playing. Um, I mean, his solo, his classic solo on You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To, it's one of my favorite solos of all time. Um, all right, I got to catch up on these comments. Sorry, guys, I'm pretty far behind. Um, I have Mitchell Tam at, yeah, I have Mitchell Tam at Stockton now. He says, hey, <laughs> Mitchell Tam. Oh, my goodness. I miss Mitchell. Mitchell, I, Skip, I got to, next time I see you or something, we got to, we got to talk, talk MT. And ask him if he remembers his nickname, MT Hammer. <laughs> What a guy. Oh, that's great. Uh, there were pentatonic shapes that would outline a minor seven. Oh, you were talking about that, the geometry. Very cool. Or make major triad. Yeah, so I'm, I'm big on triads with upper extensions over top of chords to create all, like substitutions. Check out my 251 masterclass, and I talked about that. I genuinely just joined this live stream and caught some great knowledge about where to start selling from. Thanks for making it publicly available. Brandon Green, thank you so much. Yeah, so once this is done, I started at 6 p.m. It's now 7.17, so I've been going for about an hour and 15. Afterwards, it'll be available on my channel. So just, um, uh, you can watch the whole thing from the beginning and learn even more for free. Hey Dave, have you ever heard of Earl Bostic? Of course I have. So we think of him, great player. Very underrated jazz music. Yeah, so a lot of the old school players, and I say old school as in like, the old school style as well, um, not old school as in like Charlie Parker old school, um, gets overlooked a lot, just like the Texas tenor type stuff and even like pre-bop, Coleman Hawkins and, and you know, Lester Young type players often get overlooked because, you know, we latch on to Michael Brecker and Chris Potter, and, you know, Cannonball and Kenny Garrett and all those guys and they're great. Um, but there's so many great players out there that maybe um, aren't as mainstream names I mean, Earl Bostick's a pretty well-known name, but I guess, yeah, you're right. People don't bring him up a lot. Um, but, you know, it's there's a lot of great players out there. Is improvising the same as composing and arranging? Just answer my question, never mind. Oh, yeah. So, wow, I'm that far behind. Okay. You mentioned compartmentalizing, 36251, and once as their own structures. Are these good points to choose another scale degree? Where do you mix up roots with sevens and fives in this layout? Well, that Allen 4G, that's the great thing is, is all of it, is good, it's just try different ideas. The thirds are always gonna give you the most maybe stable sound or the most information. Um, maybe not most information, but when you have seventh to third motion, that's gonna give you a lot of strong resolution sound. It's gonna help you really lock into the chords, but choosing when to land on a five or whatever, just try different ones. That's the great thing about it is trial and error is really cool. But if you understand the rules, the error part doesn't have to be that big. You can do a lot of trial, a lot of trial and a lot of success, trial and success, not so much trial and error because you know it's going to work. It's just depending on what color you're looking for. So I always say practice everything and then play what you want. And that kind of means like understand all the rules, understand how each chord tone sounds, understand how to approach it in each different way, and then say to yourself, which sound do I like the most? Once again, another cooking analogy, know how to cook many different dishes. Even if you might not like some of them, but at least you know what about them you don't like and what to avoid in the future. Oh, whenever I use this specific spice, I get a weird feeling in my throat. I don't like it. Okay, now you know not to use it. I know that I really like this, but when I combine it with this, I really like it. Do all those and then do it. There's that old saying by Charlie Parker, which people always misconstrue. They're like, Charlie Parker said, just master your instrument and then forget all that. Go up there and play. They for always forget about the first part. So they, they use that to mean he didn't think about anything. He just went up there and played whatever he wanted. You should do that. Uh, 
spoiler alert, that first part of the sentence, um, master your instrument, master the music. You know how hard that part is? Yeah, if you can master the instrument, yeah, you don't have to think up there. But for the other 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
91, 92, so 30 or 31 years, right? So it's a lot of building up of this stuff that you don't see. Everybody likes to see, this is why people like transcribing, by the way, because they want instant gratification. I like simple, cohesive, quick learning, but you still have to do all the work. People like to transcribe because they think if they transcribe a cannonball solo, that means they now have the skills that cannonball had, which is not the case. That's like saying if I took a Bob Ross painting and I tried to recreate it on the side, that means I'm now as good as Bob Ross at painting. No, I'm good at recreating what he did because I'm just parroting what he did. Um, and you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, me playing impressions is, is a combination of me listening to, you know, everybody that I love playing and taking ideas from listening to Clark Terry on trumpet and Oscar Peterson on piano, listening to the way Ed Thigpen comps and, uh, you know, uh, hearing JJ Johnson play some solos or, you know, Lee Morgan's solo break on locomotion on the blue train album. You know, all this stuff goes into me playing impressions me playing a blues and it's just combined with the skills of the parameters of the tune i'm playing to create the way i the way i play long-winded answer i don't know if it helps but i apologize hi dave what do you practice to, oh, i already just said that one thanks for the answers thanks so much mate looking forward to whatever it is <laughs> okay so guys i'm gonna get out of here i'm gonna play one more tune give me a suggestion for a tune go comment tunes and i'm gonna play a tune and then uh get on out and um you know i don't know scroll instagram or something <laughs> Tune suggestions. I'm composing a piece for my school's jazz band. I play flute, soprano, and barry sax, but orchestration is hard. I don't know much jazz theory. Also, I have no idea how to compose for drums. Any tips? Why do you have to compose a piece? You just gave me a lot of reasons why you might not be ready to compose a piece. I mean, I think you should, but why do you have to do it? Is it like for class? Um, RX Nick, what's up, Nick? Poor butterfly. Four. What's the best way to learn bebop vocab? Oh, man. Let's get into that another time. I mean, listen a lot, understand what you're listening to, but a lot of it, a lot of it is um, chromatic enclosures and leading tones. Okay, so my voice leading masterclass, I talk about that. I don't know if I get into chromaticism on there. Something else, <clears throat> I get into chromaticism um, really heavily with that. But using voice leading through lines, through changes, in a linear fashion, and then most importantly for bebop to me is the articulation. Listen, articulation is something you have to just listen for. Transcribe like Charlie Parker's articulation or Cannibal's articulation. Um, okay, uh, there's some tunes here. Do you guys want slow or fast? Or like medium slow or like up, up? What do we want? Because there's a couple tunes I could play here. Some of them are slow, some are fast, some could be both. What do you want to hear? I'm not playing after you've gone. I'll, I'll, I'll text Patrick about that and I'll ask him if I'm allowed to play that song after he shut it down. <laughs> Confirmation, that's a good one. Four is a good one. After you've gone, I'm not playing it. Blues Walk. Harlem Nocturne, good tune. Somebody wants medium. What do you guys want? Like pocket, medium? Because somebody said uh, there is no greater love, which is a great tune to play right in the pocket. It's not going to be super swinging because I'm using iReal Pro. Um, but... I think, whoops, that could be a good one. Uh, let's see. So yeah, so uh, J Wells, um, that's a that's a loaded question. Loaded question, man. Uh, I can't answer that right here. I would say, um, well, if you've done classical stuff, so writing for drums is really tricky. When I write for drums, I end up just putting um, just either slashes where I want time, whatever, the, and then write the style, and then I write hits. A lot of times I write a, a um, grand staff, so I write a time for like showing what the, what the overall hits are, and then I show like background lines and stuff. It's tough. All right, I'm gonna do um, There Is No Greater Love. Uh, here we go.
Okay, there we go. Um, very cool. You're very welcome, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the uh, talking about outlining chord changes. Um, if you didn't catch the beginning, no worries. This is going to be an archived video on my channel. And uh, yeah, you know, um, be on the lookout. So. It was very fun having all of you here. Lots of comments, lots of people stopping by. Uh, if you have any future questions, <laughs> if you have any other questions, thanks guys, thanks, thanks. Uh, any other questions about you know improvising or um, I don't know, write anything about music really. Uh, info at davepollock.com is the uh, uh, easiest way to reach me. Um, Dale, I think I owe you an email, man. Uh, uh, I apologize for that. Things got out of <laughs> things got out of my hands there for a minute. I will. Uh, I'll be reaching out to you very soon. Uh, and my apologies for not uh, not reaching out recently. Um, just saw your name pop up there, so yeah. But anyway, thank you guys so much. Um, if you don't already have the PDF. If you were not on my email list and you didn't click it, the top of the description down below, get the PDF for outlining chord changes. It's free. Make sure you download the one for your instrument. There are different keys. Um, and be on the lookout. I have a lot of cool things coming, um, especially in about, you know, a couple weeks, two and a half weeks. Uh, some really big, yeah, sorry about that, Dale. Uh, some really big stuff um, that I'm really excited for. And uh, I hope you all appreciate it. I do have a smooth jazz video in, in the works. I haven't done one of those in a while. I've been focusing on some other things, but I need to get back to my roots, guys. I was a, 
but it was a smooth jazz video on the on the lookout and it is one that a lot of you requested I'll, I'll just for those that are watching right now it uh you know the, the, the eight one eight seven seven cars for kids <laughs> so many people reach out to me about that they wanted me to do this video for so long so i'm finally going to do it uh so be on the lookout for that in the hopefully near future um <laughs> that'll be fun <laughs> Some people were actually research, reached out to me recently about asking me to do that, so I'm finally doing it. But thank you all again uh, for doing this. It's been uh, a blast. I hope you learned something. And uh, yeah, until next time, see you later. <laughs>